Let's talk a little bit about isometric. I'm I'm now going to deviate from my patient into back to being Peter uh, and interviewing. Um, we didn't talk about it, but everybody's probably heard of an isometric. It's force generation uh, or muscle contraction without movement. Big part of my recovery from shoulder surgery. I had a labral repair, uh, you know, a while ago, and this was the first thing I was permitted to do. Um, was oh, yeah. begin. Uh, you know, humeral extension and flexion without movement. And, um, you know, interestingly, I hadn't really spent much time doing isometrics outside of that with a few exceptions. There were some dedicated, a lot of isometric deadlifts I was using as a precursor to deadlifting, just a great way to sort of warm up. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't think I was actually aware that isometric training could generate or elicit the same hypertrophy response as isotonic or movement-based contraction. Um, why is that the case? Uh, how does one know where to be in the range? So for example, if I do a bicep curl, I can get every range of the bicep, but do I know if there's an isometric benefit to being here versus here versus here? Yeah. So are you 10% flexion, 30% flexion, 110% yeah. flexion? Or, uh, I have so much to say on this one. Um, are we good for another two and a half, three, we go another three hours. <laughs> good. Uh, I will say whole... this, we're, we're clearly going to do a part two of this podcast. So we'll, we'll, yeah. The, the, the... <laughs> There's a whole, a, a whole show on this area. Um, because, because of this, so you actually sort of invertedly asked, well, what's actually driving muscle hypertrophy and is it not, it's not the workout per se, it's the stimuli, right? So then what are those stimuli? That's a whole conversation. And the reason hypertrophy is training wise in terms of what reps to do, what type of exercise I consider to be the least scientific and interesting is because it takes the least precision because the mechanisms are so spread across different areas that it's sort of like, you can go from A, B, or C. You don't have to have all three. You can also have A and B, or you can have A and C, or B. you're gonna get there. Um, the muscle is very much listening to that signal. It's not so much for other things. And so it, it's very easy to kind of land accidentally in the hypertrophy range, as long as a couple of things happen. As long as sufficient overload occurs, like you're going to get there. So this overload can happen over time. It doesn't even matter how you achieve the overload. More volume, more reps per set, more weight, extra range of motion. Like all of these things are different strategies for progression. And if that happens, you're going to be in a pretty good spot. Um, so like barring the, the mechanism discussion is we're just going to get like so far down the road here, we're never going to come back and answer your, your patient question. Um, but that's that's one thing to think about. So isometrics, this, the short answer is they're, they're going to be activating a number of those same mechanisms. So you're going to cause the same amount of hypertrophy. Where do I be in that range of motion? Well, there's no answer there. This is the primary downside. This is where you'll mix it up, presumably? You certainly mix it up. In general, muscles respond best to being at the highest stretch. So if you can have that thing at the, the highest level of extension to generally, but it kind of depends on the muscle, um, you're going to generate there. You're, you're putting more, in fact, you can actually take a muscle fiber and hang it vertically and hang a weight at the end of it and it will grow. So being stretched that long is a very strong signal to grow. And so when you generally train a muscle over a large range of motion, you're putting the muscle on a larger stretch. And so that signal alone activates uh, that whole anabolic cascade for hypertrophy. So my default, if you're going to do an isometric, is to do it closer to the end range of motion of, of um, where it feels the most tight, if you will, not the, not the finished position. Yep. But it very much depends on what, what you're after. Because the thing that gets tricky here is, Many muscles are single joint. And so if you look at the soleus, as we talked about earlier, that crosses the ankle joint only. But if you look at things like the gastroc, it crosses the knee and ankle joint. So putting the, the, the soleus in the right position is only dependent upon the ankle. Putting the gastroc in the right position is dependent upon the ankle and the knee. And so if the knee is flexed, um, you're never going to get the, the gastroc to contract properly. You can't get a full contraction of the gastroc and a reflexed knee. You have to have an extended knee and extended ankle because it's going to just get short on one end of that spectrum. And the same thing happens with the so, biceps So trans muscles. translation, a seated calf raise only works the soleus. 
a standing Correct. calf raise works both gastric and soleus. Correct. Yeah. The same thing with like a tricep push down mm -hmm. versus an overhead tricep extension behind neck, right? Now you're talking the triceps muscles across the shoulder joint are now going to be put on stretch when you go behind the neck and bada bing, bada bing. So that's why I recently saw a study it. that looked at tricep extension in uh, a flexed versus extended humeral position. And yep. the difference in muscle mass was significant when the arm was up, when the humerus was flexed. Uh, ex yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Um, we see this in the hamstrings. You see this at the glutes. Like muscles like to be put on stretch. Well, they don't like it, but like they respond going to, get, to it. Yeah, you get the better. You get respond. the better compensation. Yeah. Now that changes in a situation like what you were dealing with because, like, example I use oftentimes is like imagine somebody who's kind of get like a nagging elbow pain. They're like, man, like every time I do a lot of bicep curls and stuff, my elbow just gets me. Like, oh, okay, great. Hmm. Can we actually train the biceps? without aggravating the elbow, hard to do, because no matter which brachioradialis, biceps break, like they're all going to cross the elbows. What if that's a nagging shoulder problem? Aha, well now if we do like a preacher curl, which is when your arm is out in front of you, you're shortening the biceps part that cross the shoulder joint, and you can still work across the elbow joint and it will not aggravate your shoulder. If you were to do like an incline curl where your shoulder and arm is behind you, you're putting it on a stretch across your shoulder joint, and now those bicep curls are gonna aggravate your shoulder theoretically. So going back to the isometric question, it depends on your specific surgery and whoever your obviously talented therapist or, or whoever was running that had you on us. I'm sure they were putting you in a position to get a little bit of activation in the joint that they wanted, but not actually aggravate yep. and let the thing recover. So that that's the angle you pick is dependent upon a number of factors. Um, it could be sports specific. So if you take the case of like a power lifter, like you may just want to train in your final position of your squat and get very used to being strong there. Going extra depth is only just going to make you worse as a lifter because you're now traveling further distance and you got to do more work. So there's no easy answer. That's one of the reasons why we generally frown on isometrics is they just take a lot of intention. Where if I generally just say do a normal full range squat, then you don't have to guess. So if you were, if you, if, if you, but if you had an athlete who said, look, I'm, even at this stage, I'm really willing to, to do a little bit of isometric. Um, yep. f let's say using the squat as an example, you're going to load the bar in a low position. They're going to stand under a weight that is much heavier than the, that they could ever lift and basically push up against the bar. I mean, how are you doing an isometric squat, for example? Uh, so okay, you do this in a number of ways. So you can do a bench, you can do a squat, you can do anything. Um, so typically what we'll do is you'll put the barbell in the rack. Yep. And so you can imagine like a squat rack. Yep, yep, yep. And you raise and you the arms this, of the rack. Yep. Yep. And you, you have safety pins that run horizontal yep. perpendicular to the ground, right? Yep. So instead of putting the bar on top of those, yep. you put the bar below them. And so you just lift up against the rack and nothing moves. Mm. And so you can set your position, whether you're putting it behind your neck for yep. a squat, whether you're putting a bench below it, and you just push up on those. We actually have these built in the lab. And on the bottom is a force plate. And those allows us to do an exercise or a movement called. Yeah. So um, that's how you can tell how, how heavy they're pushing. Right. And so we can measure force produced into the ground at various positions. Does isometric offer any other advantage over uh, safety? Yeah. There's a ton of advantage to it. Mm. The advantage is you have less degrees of freedom less moving parts so if i get you in a position say in a squat and your spine looks good and everything looks good there's a very low likelihood you're going to get out of position mm. if i ask you to do a, a back squat is extraordinarily complicated yeah. there's a lot of moving parts we have degrees of freedom at the ankle knee hip low back ribs shoulder neck in an isometric nothing moves all we have to deal with is compression sometimes compression is aggravating Axial loading being specific, but axial loading is also fantastic for bone mineral density. So the reason I threw isometrics in for our client, kind of working back to is you were talking about, you mentioned that as one of the problems. It's like, okay, great. We know we can smash actually on these people with very low risk and get a lot of stimuli there and not have to worry about getting in position at different parts. Mm. And we have this thing called the strength curve. When we do a typical isotonic movement, so same like a normal lift of a normal dumbbell or something. 
um, you're only going to be challenged in the areas in the range of motion where you're the weakest. So if you look at our study um, on lifting with bands, like heavy bands from a deadlift, you're going to lift at the very, very bottom and you're, you're gonna have very low load. In fact, like you could have as much as a 40% reduction in load at the bottom, but when you come up and you start crossing the knee joint and you start gaining mechanical advantage, it becomes extraordinarily easy, but the bands start getting heavier. And so the actual tonicity that happens throughout the entire thing is, is fairly equal, if not, well, certainly greater at the top. Yep. So you can train that whole area of the strength curve with things like, this is why people use bands and chains and things like that, is to be able to produce more uh, resistance in areas where they're stronger and they're not being held back by the weakest position that they're in. Yep. To wrap that up, then you can actually then train that. So then you can go into that weakest position and do an isometric in that weak position without having to put a whole bunch of load on your body like you would need to get getting to and from it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's it's nice because with people like this, you could put her in like an RDL position, like a hinge position, which is a kind of a complicated movement, and just be like grab and pull. And nothing moves and they can pull as freely and as hard as they want. It's very difficult for people with a low training age to truly express maximum force output on a, on a free range motion because there's too many variables. I'm in the right position. Is my back safe? Am I losing my balance? If I just say, grab this bar, pull on this bar as hard as you possibly can and nothing's going to move, people can just go. So walk nuts. me through how you do that for an RDL, for example. You're going to do kettlebell, dumbbell, barbell, RDL? B barbell. Okay. Barbell. Yep. Set the barbell in the squat rack. Yep put it underneath and set the height of those safety pins to whatever height feels comfortable for you. And so you'll then get in there and do that RDL and you'll pull up against that bar and nothing will move and your back will feel comfortable wherever that range of motion is for you. Mm -hmm. Your glutes can be there. Your feet can be in the right position. We get total foot, big toe activation. And you're doing this, whole you're arc. doing this two foot down. Yeah. You do one like it, yeah. okay. but you would, you would most likely start this thing two footed just to develop for this person um, in this goal, we're trying to let them express peak force output and feeling comfortable. And how long do they need to stay in that isometric position? Three seconds to some of the times we, with our athletes, we'll go up to five minute isometric holds. Up to what? Mm -hmm. How much? Five minutes. You can do like, we'll do rear foot elevated split squat hold isometric hold for up to five minutes which presents a, a tremendous neurological challenge. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 generally up for things that are ridiculous. I don't know that I could do it isometric hold for 5 minutes. Yeah, you've probably done like you've ever done like super high volume lunges or split squats yes. like hundreds. Yeah, like I've like done, I did a 4 minute set of split squats the other day. Yeah, okay. So just get in that position, rear foot elevated just a little bit. Yep. And then just hold it for 2 minutes to see. It's a fun task. You'll, you'll enjoy it. Yeah, no, I'm sure I will. Um, what are they, where are you creating the resistance for them? You're just, again, same thing, bar over shoulder. In that particular scenario, you don't need any. I see. T time will be your resistance. Oh, in other words, it's isometric only in that you're just holding a position. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're holding, it's, it's like doing a wall squat. It's yeah. like a better version of a yeah, wall squat. Yeah, yeah. So you can go for a long time. So, um, to kind of come back to your, your patient here, uh, that's what, so, that's what yeah, this those, is interesting because things. I never, so I can really see now how you could create a full day of isometrics. If that's, if you wanted to go down that rabbit hole, it's easy that one of those days is purely isometric. Oh yeah. I mean, in this situation too, even holding, not that I'm, you could hold a plank. Yeah. That is an isometric exercise, right? It's mm -hmm. the one that people love. Um, holding a hip extension position. And just making sure you can actually continue to have your glutes on and utilize. Um, you mentioned the squat earlier. So you can do this in a couple of ways. You can actually go all the way down and, and truly hold that bottom position. That is challenging, though, if people don't have the right positioning. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do, it's a or you can close. It's a great way to build it. So I wouldn't be opposed to that if they're close and doing, okay, th 30 seconds. But here's the difference. I would cap that as failure. Not when they quit or get fatigued, but when they break position. Yeah, when their form changes. That's exactly right. Yeah, we, we this is one of the tests we do with our patients, and the 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 
excellent grade is two minutes in a full 90 degree squat. Um, 90 degree. Yeah. Uh, or no, better than 90, seven, lower than 90, right? So like parallel, a uh, thigh parallel squat, sorry. So why thigh parallel? Um, that's just the standard we picked. And, yeah. but the failure, as you said, if you, you know, the goal is two minutes, can you go two minutes? And you, you fail not when you give up, you fail when you basically shoot your butt out, lunge forward, you know, make a compensatory movement that is beyond that. Uh, yeah, but we use that really as, nice we use that standard. as a great test of strength without having to put people at risk. Thank you.